Hello, my name is Emmanuel Chowdhury. I would like to thank you all for being here. My senior design project involves baseline characterization of alumina, titania, and zirconia for potential use in GAN nanowire MOSFETs. In this presentation, we will first go over a brief overview of how the films could be used in LED FET integrated GAN structures, the basic mechanism of ALD, which was the deposition method chosen, and the characterization techniques used and the results of the analysis. We finish with the conclusions and references. Gallium nitride-based light-emitting diodes are being investigated for the next-generation display technology. The persistent issue, however, has been the lack of ability to integrate transistors with LEDs for control. Dr. Zhang's team is working on a novel vertical integration scheme to fabricate nanowire LEDs with nanowire field effect transistors for the first time. This approach utilizes the unintentionally doped GAN template layer, which is common to the LED growth for the fabrication of nanowire FETs. The voltage-controlled light-emitting unit provides scaling, area savings, and easier fabrication due to the vertical integration. For these initial nanowire devices, light modulation has been demonstrated with LED turn-off at minus 10 volts. Due to the nanowire approach, these devices show over two times improvement in the on-to-off current ratios compared with the alternative integration schemes. This figure shows how the MOSFET and LED are integrated into a single nanowire structure which forms our arrays. However, we don't have as much control over the number of nanowires per unit area which means that in order for the brightness in array 1 to equal that of array 2, the drain source currents can't be the same. Since users can't change the gate to source voltage individually for each array, the manufacturers can program each array to have a threshold voltage that will allow for the same brightness from each array. This can be done by the memory device, which would allow the current to be fixed once set. This can be done by charge trapping to alter the threshold voltage individually, which depends on the gate dielectric. Finding the best gate dielectric is important as it will give better control over the FETs, won't break down easily, and gives longer lasting memory to control the LEDs. I chose alumina, titania and zirconia for this experiment as they seemed the most promising in the literature search I conducted, though they have not been as researched as hafnia. They were also chosen because the chemistries in the recipes were available readily on our ALD tool and seemed most compatible with GAN. While the silicon-based ONO stack was one of the first materials used to achieve this, its advantages related to polysilicon were a very high breakdown field, a maximum current density two orders higher than just silicon dioxide, and reduced current leakage at high values of the oxide electric field. The disadvantages are a lower charge trap state density, lower data retention capability, and a slower programming speed when compared to high K metal oxides. Eventually, the gate oxide we are aiming for will have three distinct electrical layers. A tunneling layer to regulate the flow of electrons from substrate into oxide, a charge trap layer to store the electrons, and a blocking layer between the trapping layer and metal electrode to keep the electrons from flowing out. The layers' function will be affected by the thicknesses and materials used to make them. The process flow for this experiment started with an RCA clean followed by an ALD deposition of 50 and 5 nanometer of each of the three materials, giving us a total of six wafers. Ellipsometry was used to confirm the thickness deposited. 
For the 5 nanometer wafers, the ellipsometer required the refractive index found using the corresponding 50 nanometer wafers to be input into the software. Thermally evaporated aluminum was used as the gate electrode. The GCA stepper was used to print the capacitors of varying areas and the aluminum was then wet etched. For the alumina wafers, the photoresist was stripped in the asher. However, our results indicated more plasma damage than expected. So the titania and zirconia wafers were stripped in acetone. CV testing was done then. The wafers were sintered in forming gas at 450 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, and the CV testing was done again. Atomic layer deposition was used to put down the oxide layers as it is more accurate at the nanometer level and also gives a purer composition compared to CVD deposited films. This is because it involves a series of self-limiting reactions that deposit the film one atomic layer at a time. As part of the reactions, all three films had deionized water pulsed in for 0.015 seconds followed by the respective precursors. For titania, tetrakis dimethyl amido titanium was used. For zirconia, tetrakis dimethyl amido zirconium. And for alumina, trimethyl aluminum was used. Titania was deposited at 150 degrees C, zirconia at 250 degrees C, and alumina at 200 degrees C. These temperatures were chosen based on the corresponding documented deposition rates. This is a picture of the ALD tool screen during a deposition. The spikes in the pressure versus time graph show each pulse of the precursors, the H2O followed by the corresponding precursor. One pulse of each constitutes a cycle. For an example of how ALD works, we will look at alumina. In each of the X number of cycles, the deionized water is pulsed first to prepare the surface of the wafer, followed by a few seconds to pump out the excess. Next, the precursor is pulsed in to react with the prepared surface. A few seconds is allowed for any excess precursor and the byproducts of the reaction to be pumped out before the next cycle begins. Here we see the trimethyl aluminum pulsed in after the H2O prepares the surface with OH bonds exposed for the reaction. The TMA reacts with the OH bonds, releasing methane as the byproduct, which is then pumped out. The second cycle begins with H2O pulsed in which reacts with the trimethyl groups on the TMA molecules, preparing the, for the next pulse of TMA so that the second atomic layer can be deposited. The number of cycles we pulse in dictates the thickness of the deposited film. Our baseline characterization started with ellipsometry to verify the thicknesses and obtain the refractive indices. We then analyzed capacitance voltage curves to obtain the dielectric constant. These are the most basic parameters that characterize a film's properties. The experimental values were then compared to literature values. The refractive indices obtained from the experiment were slightly lower than the literature values. This could indicate a slightly different stoichiometry, that is, the atomic ratios are slightly different, which might be due to the relatively low deposition temperatures in ALD. We also found that the zirconia deposition rate provided by the manufacturer was off by 3 nanometers. For the purpose of our experiment, a larger number of cycles was used to redeposit the zirconia. The values here are from the redeposition. We speculate that the 3 nanometer offset may be due to improper surface preparation of the bare silicon substrate. Next, the dielectric constant was found by analyzing the capacitance voltage curves for the 50 nanometer films. The dielectric constant and area of the capacitor has to be input to the software 
and the corresponding thickness is extrapolated. I started with the literature values and used trial and error to find the best value that fit. I have done the calculations by hand for zirconia as an example of how this is done by the software. The dielectric constants for all three materials found before Sinter are listed here. They are within the expected range of values. The corresponding thicknesses that I tried to match are listed alongside them. The capacitance voltage curves can be used to extract information about fixed charge, interface traps, etc. This plot shows the parallel shift effect of the fixed charge at the interface and the distortion effect due to interface charge traps. Passivating the interface traps should return the CV characteristics to near ideal. Our test equipment from NDC, the software only gives us the NSS values which encompass the four types of defects, mobile and fixed charges, bulk and interface traps. The values are rather high for the few wafers that worked well enough to give us good CV curves. While the charge trapping mechanism we are hoping for requires some defects to be present, preferably in the bulk of the oxide, more analysis and tests need to be done to separate out the contribution of each of the four types of defects to the NSS value. The large NSS values are indicative of processing issues. For alumina, the curves were right shifted, which I believe to be the result of plasma damage in the photoresist ASHA. Since sintering moved the curves further to the right with the oxide defects doubling after the center in forming gas, which is known to remove interface traps, it is likely that the fixed charge was positive and the negatively charged traps were initially combating its effect. The effect of the center needs further investigating as does the reason why the center corrupted the zirconia and titania wafers that did give us some results. The NSS data obtained from the 50 nanometer alumina film before and after the center has, was performed to see how the defect states changed. While the defect state's amount increased, it is likely that the cause of this was the undoing of the cancellation effect of the negative interface traps on the positive fixed charge. However, in both cases, the 50 nanometer alumina produced typical CV curves unlike the titanium and zirconium oxides. In characterizing the 5 nanometer dielectrics, we see that the aluminum oxide after center showed issues as the voltage sweep entered the accumulation region of the curve. This may be possibly due to the electric field from the bias approaching the dielectric strength of the field. The titanium oxide shows a severe stretch in the curve, which most likely implies a poor quality silicon oxide interface. The shift to the right is severe as well, showing a lot of trapped charge. It also seems to never really reach accumulation. Since the CV curves for 5 nanometer did not give ideal capacitive behavior, we looked at the conductance voltage curves and compared them to that of the 50 nanometer film, which did exhibit reasonable CV characteristics to see what was going on. The one on the right is from the 5 nanometer films, which didn't work. There is supposed to be no current flowing in the accumulation region. However, we see that there is a great deal of conductance in accumulation region for the 5 nanometer wires. For the 50 nanometer wafers, there is a shifting of charge in the depletion region, which results in a peaking around voltage equals zero. Since the conductance plots for the two samples are dramatically different, it is connected to the CV plots. However, that is a whole other aspect which could be looked into in another project. A DC bias stress was done in an attempt to demonstrate some degree of charge retention. However, it's uncertain what the shift, however small, is due to. 
With a multi-layer stack, the tunneling and trapping would become clearer. While the next natural step is to stack these layers using different materials and thicknesses for each of the functions, there are some effects observed in this preliminary experiment that may need looking into. The data on the zirconium and titanium oxides indicate that the effect of annealing and forming gas, and perhaps of annealing itself, on the layers individually may need its own experiment. Since there was an issue with the deposition of zirconia, it is possible the standard RCA clean was insufficient to optimize the surface of the wafer for the process. The 50 nanometer TiO2 wafer gave us leaky capacitors before and after sinter, though a few of the capacitors on the 5 nanometer film appear to work. An interesting result since the 5 nanometer films are the ones that usually give current leakage. We could also look at ALD depositions at slightly higher temperatures to affect the stoichiometry and give better quality films to start with, even if the deposition rates are slightly lower in some cases. This is a list of the references used in this presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Zhang for taking me on for this project, Professors Pearson, Jackson and Hirschman for their invaluable support and guidance, Matthew and Vijay Gopal for their guidance and help, Mr. O'Brien, Mr. Tolson and Mr. Battaglia for their support in the clean room. Thank you for your time and attention.